Thank you everyone for joining the webinar today. We will begin shortly. Before we do, we wanted to go over a few housekeeping items. One is that we want to make sure that you have an opportunity to interact with us. We welcome your questions and your comments. You can send us any questions through the Q&A feature, as well as uh, watch out for the chat. We'll be sending you some important links and uh, information for you to know and follow along as we give the presentation. Please don't worry about taking detailed notes. We will be sharing the presentation after this session. We are offering closed captioning and Zoom technical support. We do want this to be engaging and we want to hear from you. So please do interact with us throughout and then we'll have a Q&A feature at the end. We also want to let you know that we're going to request your feedback and this is a link to our feedback form. We hope this will be the first of many opportunities we have to engage with you. We also hope that you'll consider following us on Twitter as well as LinkedIn. With that, let's get started. I'd like to officially welcome you to the National Institute on Aging Small Business Seed Fund, Driving Alzheimer's and Aging Related Innovations Through Small Business Funding. Today, we'll go through some of our objectives, give you a detailed overview of the programs and the small business opportunities and resources, and we'll also have a moderated Q&A. We'll be able to answer some of your specific questions. Just to highlight again, there is a Q&A feature, and you can see that at the bottom of your screen. It's a little Q&A box. Sometimes it shows on the right, depending on your computer, as well as the chat feature. So please do engage with us. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome our key speaker today, uh, Dr. Stephanie Davis. I'm your facilitator. Monique Larocque, and we also have our partners on the line with us today. Thank you to NIA for hosting this webinar. As well, I'd like to thank our host, uh, Dr. David Walk from the Paramount School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Walk. Hi, uh, everyone. Um, I'm David Walk. I'm uh, the co-associate director of the Alzheimer's Disease um, Center here, and I co-direct our Penn Memory Center. It's really great to have you all um, participating in this, this event. Um, I uh, will be the director of our center with the uh, renewal of our grant going in. And just to give you an idea of the Alzheimer's Disease Center here very briefly, um, we're a, a center that deeply phenotypes um, a cohort of around 500 or so individuals um, with cognitive and clinical data, neuroimaging, um, with genetics and uh, genomic data, uh, biofluids, and in many, uh, we get tissue and autopsy. And our goal as a center is really to be a fertile ground for uh, collaborations on innovative projects. And so we're very uh, interested and would, would love to hear ideas from any of you about I um, about grants that um, would fall under this this mechanism and we actually have a couple of uh, of grants so thank you everyone for attending thank you and uh, we have provided dr walk's contact information should you have a need to reach him and you can also ask us any questions during the q a with that i'd also like to thank our co-host uh, dr oscar lopez he is at UPMC and is the, at the University of Pittsburgh ADRC and Professor of Neurology and Psychiatry. Dr. Lopez. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, thank you for participating in this uh, interesting meeting. Uh, just a few words about the ADRC, the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center at the University of Pittsburgh started in 1985. Uh, we are very, um, we are actively conducting research in imaging, uh, neuropathology, and genetics. Uh, and one thing that is very important, we partnered in the past, some of our researchers partnered in the, partnered in the past with uh, the SBIR with uh, very successful outcomes. Uh, we continue having projects that can be uh, done through this mechanism and we have the help 
of the Innovation Institute at the University of Pittsburgh. Thank you. Thank you, and I, I'm delighted to have both of you as our partners today. We know that uh, innovation comes from many different players coming together from university medical centers and research centers. The NIH plays a critical role as well as the private sector and our small, and small business biotechs and research organizations. So we are hopeful today that we're able to share some information that will help you be successful and uh, develop some interesting and innovative technologies that will have public benefit. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Stephanie Davis. Thank you, Stephanie. Thanks for the introduction, Monique. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. So I wanted to start off by talking a little bit about the Small Business Innovation Research and the Small Business Tech Transfer Programs, also known as the SBIR and STTR grant programs. So these are two congressionally mandated programs that are required for all federal agencies that fund research and development. And what they do is they take a specific um, percentage of their budget and put it towards a set aside fund that will go towards businesses that are conducting R&D and developing technologies that are in line with that agency's mission. So they are very similar in their scope. Um, the biggest difference between the two is that the SBIR program has a much larger budget. So the SBIR program has 3.2% um, of the set aside funds while the STTR program has 0.45% of the set aside funds. And in the case of the STTR program, it is mandatory that the small business being funded has a collaboration with a nonprofit research partner. So usually that's somebody who's at a university. Um, with the SBIR program, it is not required, but in some cases there is a collaboration. Next slide. So what are the advantages to seeking SBIR and STTR funding? Uh, the biggest advantage I would say is that it's non-dilutive funding. So it's not a loan, it doesn't require repayment, and it has no impact on your stocks or your shares. It also allows the small business to retain the intellectual property rights. This is especially notable in the case of small tech transfer awards where there's a collaboration with a research institution, the small business still gets to retain their intellectual property rights. Um, it provides recognition um, and visibility to the business. And it also can help you with attracting other third party investors because it's proof that you are able to attract third party funding. Thus, it makes it more likely for other invest investors outside the government to give your business money. Next slide. So these are the eligibility criteria for businesses to participate in the SBIR and STTR programs. Please note that these are not determined by the NIH. These are set by the Small Business Administration. So unfortunately, there is no waiver on these requirements. You have to fulfill all of them. But uh, the basics are that the applicant, um, the key applicant must be the small business. The business must be an organized for-profit small business concern within the U.S. Um, it must have 500 or fewer employees. However, most businesses that are funded by the SBIR program are much smaller than that. It has to be greater than 50% U.S. owned by individuals and independently operated. Or um, in the case of businesses that are owned by multiple venture capital firms, um, there just has to be a case where one VC firm does not own more than 50% of the business. Um, if you have any questions about these, please feel free to contact SBIR, STTR program staff, because as I mentioned, these requirements are non-negotiable. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, there are a few differences between the SBIR and STTR programs, although their mission is similar. Um, so with an SBAR grant, it does not require a collaboration between the small business and a nonprofit research partner. Um, but with an SBAR grant, the, the PD or PI has to be primarily um, affiliated with the small business. And for a phase one grant, you may outsource no more than 33% of your activities to um, you know, a sub award consortium. So most of the work, so more than 67% needs to be done by the small business in the phase one portion of your project. 
when you go to the phase two portion, it can go up to 50% can be subcontracted out. Um, with the STTR awards, at least 40% of the work must be done by the small business and at least 30% of the work must be done by the nonprofit research partner. Uh, the other 30%, it doesn't matter. It can be done by either party or you know, subcontracted out to an additional party. Um, however, I should note that with the STTR subcontracting requirements, that is also stipulated by the Small Business Administration, so it is also non-negotiable. Um, with the STTR program, there's also a required intellectual property agreement that needs to be filled out by the small business and by the academic institution um, that basically dictates that the small business will be able to maintain their intellectual property rights. And finally, with the STTR program, the PI does not have to be primarily uh, employed by the small business. However, um, the PI does need to have at least 10% effort on the project. Um, but with both of these programs, the award is still made to the small business. Next slide. So the NIH um, and the NIA fund basically three main um, levels of uh, research and development here. So some institutions, uh, um, some agencies, such as the Department of Defense, have what's known as a phase three program where the government agency acts as a buyer. The NIH and the NIA do not do that. Um, so once you get past the phase 2B portion, we are expecting the businesses to be able to attract third party investment from non government organizations. But um, for the phases that we do fund, we fund phase one studies, which are mostly um, proof of concept and feasibility studies. So for this portion, we provide awards that are up to a year in length. And in terms of budgets, um, they can go up to $300,000 budget caps for the omnibus topics, or if you have a proposal related to Alzheimer's disease or AD related dementias, it can go up to $500,000 per year. Uh, for the phase two portion of the award, this is more for larger scale development and full research and development. So once you've completed those feasibility studies, you can kind of expand and also uh, focus more on the commercialization of your technology. So this award can go up to two years in length. Um, for most topics covered under the omnibus, it can be up to $2 million over those two years. Um, for Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, that budget cap goes up to 2.5 million. Um, and one of the biggest differences between the phase one and the phase two programs is that for the phase two, you are required to submit a commercialization plan, which is going to show the reviewers and the program staff how you plan to bring your product to the market. There are some other options in terms of uh, grant proposals outside of the normal phase one and phase two. There is the fast track option, which is what I call the two for one special. So this is where you basically apply for a phase one and a phase two together. The advantage of a fast track is that you, as soon as you meet your phase one milestones, you don't have to reapply for the phase two. You can just proceed directly to the phase two part of the proposal. The downside is that fast track proposals are harder to get. Um, another option that has become more popular in recent years is the direct to phase two. Um, so this option is only available for the SBIR program, but it does allow for businesses that have already done their discovery and feasibility studies. So the work that would normally be performed in a phase one, it allows them to proceed directly to a phase two award. Um, and it avoids having the NIH fund a study that's already really been done. Um, and then also we have the commercialization readiness pilot or CRP program and the phase 2B programs. So these are available um, to, in the case of the CRP program, current and past phase two awardees. Um, it gives extra funds for late stage research and development and technical assistance that is required for the commercialization of a product. The phase 2B is a competing renewal award that can be um, obtained after the phase two portion. Um, this will fund a company up to three years and up to 300, uh, sorry, 3 million total costs. And it also comes with the uh, expectation that the company will try to get matching funds from other third party investors. Next slide. 
So with your, um, so with your budgets, um, it's important to know that the SBA or budgets are defined by the total cost and you need to follow the subcontracting limitations for the phase and the type of proposal you're applying for. For example, the subcontracting requirements for SBIRs versus STTRs. Also, the budget allowance for each funding opportunity announcement will differ, so be sure to read the text carefully so you know what the budget caps are. So for all awards, a company can request a 7% fee, and a fee is basically a profit. And it's a portion of the total budget where we will not track where that money goes. So you can basically use it on whatever you want. Um, for, in terms of fee for service type activities, so for example, if you want to hire a CRO to perform a particular research services, you can um, include those with your small business costs, but there are a few requirements. So it has to be a commercially available service. The small business must do all analyses. So the CRO can do the procedures, but they have to return the data to the business for the business to analyze. And also it needs to be a fee for basis. So you're not allowed to cover indirect costs for the service providers. Next slide. So the NIA small Office of Small Business Research covers many different tasks and we wear many hats. So first of all, we're the central coordination office and we're responsible for administering all small business awards at the NIA. We also provide guidance to applicants and you know, we're here to answer their questions and discuss their options when it comes to submitting proposals, outreach activities. So um, before COVID, we did a lot of in-person outreach events uh, and workshops. These days we do a lot of webinars because that's what we can do. Um, but these events are designed to raise awareness of the funding opportunities available for small businesses in the aging sector. Um, for funding, so we provide obviously grant money for uh, small businesses that are conducting R&D within the mission of the NIA. For networking, we facilitate connections between awardees and strategic partners, such as potential collaborators and investors. So some of the examples of the stakeholder engagement projects we've done is um, a collaboration with the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation, which we have created a bridge funding program as well as the Longevity Innovation Summit. Um, and then finally, we also provide entrepreneurial training um, on different commercialization ready uh, related topics. And we also provide coaching so that companies can be prepared to pitch at different investor showcases. Next slide. So um, we have several different resources to help entrepreneurs at different stages of funding. So for example, for, um, for applicants who've never been successful, we have the Applicant Assistance Program. Uh, this is a program that NIA participates along with seven other NIH ICs. And it's a 10 week coaching program that is designed to help you develop your application and become more familiar with the small business uh, grant process. So um, we offer 15 slots for uh, companies that have never been funded for each funding period. And just a reminder that the due date for the January 2021 cohort is tomorrow. So if you're interested in participating in this program, get your applications in ASAP. Um, some of the other resources we have available are technical assistant budget allowance funds. So these are funds that are available for phase one and phase two awardees that can cover activities such as um, market analysis, intellectual property protection, access to technologies. So anything related to technical assistance uh, can be covered by these funds. So you do need to request them at the time of the application and you are allowed to request up to $6,500 for a phase one proposal and up to 50,000 for a phase two. The diversity supplement is specifically designed to help small businesses um, attract and retain um, diverse talent, specifically students, postdocs, and other investigators who are from historically underrepresented groups. The C3I program is designed specifically for medical device innovators, and it provides them 24 weeks of entrepreneurial training and coaching. Um, being one of the institutes in the National Institutes of Health, um, the NIA can also take advantage of the resources in the NIH seed office, which is the Small Business Entrepreneurial Education and Development Office. 
So some of these resources include regulatory support and our entrepreneurs in residence. And then finally, phase one awardees can participate in the i program. Um, so this is an eight week intensive course that allows um, companies to get hands on training and feedback from potential stakeholders and customers. Um, so this is available to all phase one awardees and they can apply kind of on a first come first serve basis. Next slide. So what are what topic areas are we looking for at the NIA? So we're looking for innovative solutions that are going to meet significant unmet clinical needs. Uh, we're also looking for proposals that focus on the development of something with significant commercial potential. Um, we want the proposals to be able to leverage the expertise of the company, the founder, or the business team as well as in the case of phase one, we want to look for feasibility data for that product that's being developed or product focused development activities in the case of a phase two proposal. So generally the NIA covers a broad range of topics related to um, aging focused diseases, but the one disease where we focus on um, that's kind of unique to NIA is Alzheimer's disease and then AD related dementias. So specifically, if you have a proposal that focuses on Alzheimer's disease, um, we actually provide higher budget caps for phase one and phase two proposals. So instead of 300,000 and 2 million for a phase one and phase two, we offer up to 500,000 for a phase one and 2.5 million for a phase two. That is, if you go through our specific Alzheimer's disease and AD related dementia funding opportunity announcements. So some of the Research focus areas for AD and ADRD research include the development of new treatments, diagnostic tools, tools for caregivers, research tools, um, health IT and digital health type applications, um, and you know some of the other um, types of technologies that are listed here. Next slide. So this infographic here shows the general process that has to occur from the time you submit your application until the time it's funded. So um, when you compose your proposal and when you submit it electronically on grants.gov, it is assigned to the NIH Center for Scientific Review, where the scientific review officers are going to figure out which institutes or centers are best equipped to fund your application. And that's usually going to focus on what your disease area is. Um, so this process takes about one to two months. And during this time, uh, your application is going to be, um, it's going to be reviewed by a scientific review group or a study section. And this is going to be a team of, uh, it contains academic scientists as well as scientists with more of a business background. And they're going to review your grant based on its scientific and commercialization potential. So, once the review occurs, it's going to be assigned a priority score and it's going to be sent to the advisory council for each institute. So the advisory council will generally recommend the approval um, of certain grants to get funded. And then once that happens, the institute staff are going to prepare a funding plan for the director. Um, one to two months later, the institute will allocate funds. And after that, you will finally get um, notified that you have received funding for your proposal. Uh, this entire process can take anywhere from five to 12 months, uh, especially if you have to resubmit your application. So the moral of the story is that although we're trying to make the process faster, it's still a lengthy process. And we recommend going after any funding sources possible um, especially if you're trying to close that funding gap between your phase one and your phase two proposals. Next slide. So these are the application um, standard due dates, September 5th, April 5th, and January 5th. Um, keep in mind that if one of these standard due dates falls on a weekend, it's going to be the next business day. So um, for each, for example, for the September due date, which is the most recent, the review meetings usually happen in November. Um, the applications are scored and these scored applications are recommended for funding by the advisory council in January. And then the earliest project start date will usually be in April. So these dates will differ usually based on the time of the year. So there is the, um, the smallest funding lag for the April cycle, 
and the longest funding lag for the September cycle, which is about seven months, just due to the fact that Congress has to approve the new budget. So just once again, um, a reminder that if you're planning on applying, please allow for that time lag. Next slide. So, um, you know, these are, as I mentioned before, we have a pretty broad disease focused area. So we focus on Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, as well as aging in place, other age related disease and conditions such as osteoarthritis, urinary incontinence. Um, we focus on the development of research tools. Um, and here are just some of the various um, areas of interest that we focus on that are in line with um, our different scientific divisions. So if you look at the right, it's going to show the breakdown of our small business portfolio, including those um, focused on Alzheimer's disease and non-Alzheimer's disease. So about 32% of our um, portfolio consists of therapeutics. And then the next biggest categories include digital and mobile health or health IT applications, um, sensors and monitoring devices, supportive devices, and then finally, about 20-21% um, about of our portfolio consists of research tools, in vitro diagnostics, and imaging devices. Now, just keep in mind that this breakdown does differ from year to year, and you know, it really just depends on what applications we get during um, a certain funding period. Next slide. So here are the main funding opportunity announcements that we currently have available. For the omnibus funding opportunity announcement, we will fund studies that include clinical trials and do not include clinical trials. And for the omnibus, these are generally, um, we will accept applications that have anything to do with the National Institute on Aging's mission. So um, in the case of NIA, Usually we recommend that those who are developing technologies um, outside of the area of Alzheimer's disease and AD related dementias. So anything else aging related, we recommend to go through the omnibus. However, if you are developing a, um, a technology that relates to Alzheimer's disease, we would strongly recommend that you go through the Alzheimer's disease focused funding opportunity announcement which includes PAS 19316 for the SBIR version and PAS 19317 for the STTR version. The reason why is because um, we usually recommend people who are focusing on other disease areas to apply for the omnibus. And also, if you are focusing on AD, you might as well take advantage of the higher budget limits. In addition, we also have another focused funding opportunity announcement um, PAR-18512 or 514, and this focuses on the development of lifespan or health span extending interventions for Alzheimer's disease and AD-related dementia patients. Next slide. So in addition to the omnibus and ADRD focused funding opportunity announcements, we also have solicitations for the commercialization readiness pilot program, which I mentioned previously, this is open to either past or current phase two awardees. And it provides extra money uh, for um, activities that are not normally allowed under the omnibus or ADRD funding opportunity announcements. So um, there's two different types of the commercialization readiness programs. The first one, which is PAR 20128, is just the one that provides for technical assistance, uh, and that covers up to 300,000. But we recommend uh, applying through the others, so PAR 20-129 or 130, because these will not only cover technical assistance activities, but they will also provide uh, funding for late stage clinical um, and research development. So the budget limit for these two awards is um, up to $3.3 million over a two year period. And what's important about the CRPs is that they're, they don't have the same subcontracting restrictions that the phase two or even phase two B programs have. So it is possible for this particular program to outsource nearly all of your activities. If for example, you want a CRO to perform some activities that you can't do in-house. 
We also participate in the administrative supplement to promote diversity in research and development, which gives money to small businesses to hire individuals from historically underrepresented groups. And then also the, uh, the SBAR technology transfer FOA. So this one gives the opportunities for small businesses to collaborate with intramural labs. Next slide. So as I mentioned in the previous slide, um, if you have already been given a phase two award, you can um, apply for the commercialization readiness pilot program. So it can either be given at the same time as uh, a phase two or a phase two B award, or it can be given after a phase two or phase two B award. Um, and it is a different, um, different research activity mechanism, the SB1, um, and the reason why this is important is because unlike the phase two um, for SBIR and STTRs, it doesn't have a subcontracting restriction. So you still need to justify your subcontracting plan, but it's not subject to the 50% restriction that the R42 or R44 is. Um, it also includes special research review criteria, um, which focuses on the innovation of the product. So you do have to submit a separate proposal for the CRP program, but it's going to be reviewed separately compared to the, your parent award. And then, as I mentioned before, it provides funding for activities that are not typically supported by research grants. So if you want to perform some activities that normally you wouldn't be able to do because of subcontracting restrictions, the CRP will give you the opportunity to have NIH cover those activities. Next slide. Um, the diversity supplement program, uh, as I mentioned before, the goal is to increase the diversity of the research workforce by providing funding for small businesses to hire and retain individuals from historically underrepresented backgrounds. So to apply for this program, you need to identify the candidate and provide a strong career development plan. And for this one, um, since it is a supplement, it is accepted on a rolling basis. Next slide. So although some of the review criteria that small business grants share with academic grants are still there. So for example, um, you know, you do have criteria such as the environment, such as the significance, innovation, and approach are the same, there's going to be a slightly different focus for an SBIR or an STTR grant. Um, the main goal of the academic grant is to increase the breadth of scientific knowledge. With an SBIR or STTR grant, the main goal is to develop and commercialize a product. So while the research and development is mandatory for a small business grant, your main goal is to use that research and development to lead to a new product. So just keep that in mind when you're writing your proposal. Next slide. So here are the review criteria that are used to review small business grants. Um, so the first five criteria are shared with academic grants. Um, the commercialization, so the final criterion is different. This is only for small business grants. Um, but the criteria that are shared with academic grants, you know, for example, when you're looking at the significance of an application, you're not just looking at does it expand, you know, our scientific knowledge. You're looking at does it address an important unmet clinical need and is it going to be commercially viable? So is there a market for this product you're developing? For innovation, you want to show that your new product is significantly different from other approaches that have been proposed before and also different from products that are on the market. You need to show that you have some sort of competitive advantage compared to what's currently available. And then finally, for the commercialization criteria, you want to show that you have a business strategy that's going to give you a high potential for success. So in addition to having a strong scientific justification, um, you also want to show that you have a, a solid business strategy. Next slide. So um, before you send any documents and before you um, compose your entire research proposal, the most important document to start off with is the specific aims page. So this is kind of the executive summary that is used by NIH staff 
Um, and what it includes is a broad overview of your product and what you're trying to develop as well as the aims of your proposal. So the aims are kind of the key goals that you want to meet for your proposal. And these include the different metrics that you're going to use to determine if these goals have been met. So just to give you a background on how to um, compose a strong specific aims page, the first one half to two thirds are going to be the elevator pitch. So you want to show why your proposal is meritorious, what unmet need is met, um, your value proposition, you want to explain or show any preliminary data that you've collected, and you want to explain why it's relevant to the mission of the NIA. Then the last one third to one half of the page is going to be your specific aims. So these are going to include um, your goals that you want to meet, the key models, assays, and metrics you're going to use to evaluate whether you met these goals, as well as your performance milestones. Um, so you want to make sure that you provide your specific aims page to NIA staff for feedback. One thing we also want to emphasize is that we would recommend that you reach out to them at least one month before the grant deadline. If you wait too long uh, before the grant deadline, usually program staff and OSBR staff are going to be very busy and there's no guarantee that they will be able to give you the time and effort needed to be you know, give you a really critical overview. So the earlier you can send it to us, the better. Next slide. So if you have any questions about the small business application process, um, most of the questions that you have can be answered with the SF424 application guide. Um, so this can be found at the form uh, at the link below. And if you have any questions, we recommend using control F uh, in the search function because it's a very long document. Next slide. So if you want to see what a well-written small business sample application looks like, our sister institute, the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Disease, has several small business applications available um, that correspond to projects that were previously funded by NIAD. So these are SBIR applications that scored very highly in review, and they are available for you to kind of see what components are there in a, in a well-written application. And all of the links to the sample applications can be found in the presentation, which will be sent out later. Next slide. So when you are putting together your proposal, you want to think about who's going to review your application. Uh, as I previously mentioned, the scientific review groups or the study sections um, are going to consist of both academic and, you know, reviewers who have more of an industry or business focus. Um, so you have to know your audience when you are putting together your proposal. Um, the primary reviewers are going to be the ones who read your application and lead the discussion. However, all members of the study section are responsible for scoring your application. So when you are going to put your application together, you can actually look at the Center for Scientific Review website to pick a study section that best has the expertise that you're looking for to review your application. Um, you can also, in addition to suggesting a study section that you think would be good to review your application, you can request um, an institute. So for example, if you're going to be um, you know, submitting a proposal that focuses on a new drug for Alzheimer's disease, you can suggest us as well as the National Institute for the Neurological Disorders and Stroke. We highly suggest um, putting down more than one IC because if in one case, one of the ICs is not able to fund an application, it can still potentially be funded by another. So it is a good idea to put down a secondary institute as well. And finally, if you're looking for a specific scientific area of expertise, um, on the PHS assignment requests form, there are some little blank spaces at the bottom where you can list the areas of expertise that you would like to review your proposal. You're not able to request specific reviewers, but you can put the areas of expertise you need. Next slide. So in addition to your specific aims page, your research strategy is arguably one of the most important parts of your application. Uh, this is going to kind of give the reviewer a sense of the plan that you have to achieve your aims. 
You want to address all of the review criteria clearly, provide sufficient background information, and a detailed technical plan that's going to uh, achieve the specific aims of your study. When you're writing your research strategy, you want to be conscious of the budget and time constraints. So don't be too ambitious, but do just enough so that you're going to be able to achieve your aims. Um, although you are not required to have preliminary data for a phase one study, it is suggested that you have it because you need it to be competitive. Um, if you have any potential pitfalls to your research strategy, don't ignore them because the reviewers will find them and point it out. So you want to make sure if there are pitfalls that you identify them and then identify um, alternative strategies. Um, and the reviewers do tend to focus very strongly on the research strategy. I would say when an applicant ends up not getting funded, more times than not, it's because they scored low on the research strategy. So this is a section that you want to pay particularly close attention to. And finally, make sure to adhere to the page limits. So for a phase one, you can have no more than six pages in your research strategy. And for a phase two, it has to be no more than 12 pages. Next slide. Um, what's also important to have in your application are letters of support. So if you have any consultants, collaborators, um, other stakeholders or key opinion leaders that are not listed on the application, you can have them write letters of support showing that they, have, um, they are um, on board with your project. Um, for a phase two award, you wanna make sure that you have the commercialization plan. And this is another area of prioritized real estate. So in um, for phase two and fast track awards, the commercialization plan is a really important portion of the application. So just like the research strategy, you wanna make sure it's well written. Also, you want to include bio sketches for all senior and key personnel, the budgets for each project period, descriptions of facilities and equipment, and if applicable, um, the forms necessary for human subjects research and vertebrate animal research. Next slide. So if you weren't funded on the first try, that's okay. It's not the end of the world. Most people are not funded the first time. So you really want to reach out to your program officer to review the summary statement and use the reviewer comments to improve your application. It's important when you're looking at these comments to be constructive and not defensive. But, uh, you know, even if you're not funded the first time, uh, that's okay. Only about 12.5% of new applications are funded the first time. But when you look at resubmissions, about 26% are funded. So the rate of success doubles um, once you resubmit. Also, we recommend talking to successful applicants and understanding the scientific review process. Um, talking to people who have successfully submitted proposals, they usually know the tricks of the trade, so they are really great people to consult with. Next slide. So here is a list of important resources, including the sample applications, annotated form sets, uh, an infographic of the application process, and um, our webpage for the NIA Office of Small Business Research. Um, so if you want to see what's currently being funded by the NIH, go to NIH Reporter. And in, under Reporter, there's another tool called NIH Matchmaker, which is very useful. It is able to help you find similar projects to your proposal and program staff. So for example, if you take your specific aims page, paste it in the box, it can pull up a list of program staff from, uh, for example, NIA, who have the area of expertise that, folk, that matches your project. And also we have animal model resources for those that are performing preclinical um, studies. Next slide. And finally, don't forget to connect with us. Um, visit our website, follow us on Twitter. Um, we also have a new LinkedIn page. So if you're on LinkedIn, be sure to follow us. Um, and this is really important because we often post new funding opportunities and outreach events and other things that might be of interest. So be sure to follow us on social media um, and join our mailing list. And if you have any questions, email us at niasmallbusiness at mail.nih.gov. Next slide. And if you have any questions, 
Be sure to select the Q&A icon from your menu bar and type the question into the box. So um, if you do that, Monique will read your question and um, direct it to me. So uh, also note that if your question is similar to another one, it might be combined. So just keep note of that. Next slide. Thank you, Stephanie. So we are getting a few questions in and uh, just wanted you to know we're collating them. And as Stephanie mentioned, we combine where they're like questions. Um, if you do still have something, please feel free to send it to us. We'll get started just shortly. But I did want to encourage you now that you've heard the presentation to fill out the feedback form and we'll rechat that out. And then the other piece I wanted to make sure uh, we highlighted again is that if you are interested in uh, becoming a, an applicant, there is an application assistance program opportunity tomorrow. The, um, the application for that is very, very um, simple. It's almost like a Google form, if you will. Um, so it's, it's very streamlined, just a few questions, and it's a good way to potentially be considered and get that support to develop a, a successful application. So please do check that out. Um, with that, I'm going to turn over to a few of our questions um, from our audience. And um, the first relates to um, what people can use funds for. So let's go on that theme for a little while. Um, does the SBIR budget allow for renting laboratory space and patenting? Um, so in terms of the laboratory space, so that's going to be covered by your indirect, so your um, facilities costs. Um, in terms of patenting, um, if you need intellectual property expertise, you can specify that with the technical assistance budget allowance, so the TABA funds. So for example, if you're applying to a phase one, you can use some of that $6,500 for intellectual property expertise, but you do have to specify that. Um, another alternative is you can use some of your fee for that as well, because the 7% fee, we're not going to track where it goes. If you'd like to use that on um, IP consultants, that's possible as well. But we do recommend requesting the TABA funds, because if you need them, then they're there. Thank you, Stephanie. A couple questions about outsourcing. Um, is it possible to outsource for more than 50% of the funding when it comes to clinical trials? So um, if it is an SBIR award, um, there are exceptions to be made. Um, <clears throat> because the SBIR subcontracting restrictions are not stipulated by the SBA, it is possible, but you do have to get approval to do that. Uh, we highly recommend if you are planning on going, you know, far above and beyond the 50% restriction to propose those activities um, with the commercialization readiness program. Um, so, for example, PAR-20-130 allows for clinical trials, and for this, you can use that money and um, you can virtually subcontract out all of it, and NIA is not going to have a problem with it because it is an SB1 mechanism. So, you know, specifically, if you're a phase two awardee, we highly recommend applying for that if you're going to have significant costs that need to be outsourced. Thank you. And there are a couple other questions I will encourage them. Some of them are very specific um, to unique situations and we would encourage you to email us. Um, Stephanie, one question is about the fee for service and one, what of that is considered the outsourcing budget? Would we categorize that as an outsourcing budget item? Um, generally speaking, so if it, if it fulfills those requirements, then no. Um, if you are going to, like, for example, if you're going to be having a CRO perform a particular service and they're not going to be doing any analysis or having any sort of say in the actual proposal, then no. Um, but for example, if you're collaborating with like a university and they're going to be doing animal work for you, but they're also going to be like analyzing the data and really participating in the actual research and analysis, then that would be considered um, a subcontracting cost. So it really just depends upon whether or not it's just someone performing a single service and handing you the data back versus do you actually have people who are actively participating in data analysis and interpretation. Thank you. And we did get a couple of questions with folks trying to understand 
the uh, set aside uh, percentages and those are mandated. Uh, but just to dig in a bit, um, someone wants to know among the, if they have to decide whether to apply for an SBIR or SCTR, they want to understand whether um, there's a higher uh, opportunity to get one or the other. And what happens if you are reviewed in the same study section? How do you, you know, how do you decide on awarding SBR versus STTR? So um, if you are unsure about whether or not you should submit an SBIR or an STTR, we, we highly suggest consulting with OSBR staff. Um, there isn't really a difference in success rates. The pool of money for STTR is smaller, but we also get less applications or fewer applications for the STTR program compared to the SBIR program, so it does even out. Um, if you are an academic entrepreneur and you're primarily affiliated with a university, like if that's your primary place of employment, I would recommend an STTR just because it's often um, kind of, you know, especially for a phase one, if the PI is primarily affiliated with a research university, it's hard for them, you know, to adhere to those subcontracting restrictions. So it's often easier to just have that be an STTR. But it really just depends upon what personnel you're going to have on your proposal and, you know, what you need to get done. Um, but we suggest reaching out to program staff uh, and asking them to see, you know, what your best strategy would be going forward. Thank you. Next question relates to the commercialization um, plan and does the fast track require uh, an applicant to propose a commercialization plan immediately? Yes. So with the fast track, it has all of the same app um, components as a phase one and a phase two together. So even though you do have a phase one component to your fast track application, you do have to have a commercialization plan as well. Thank you. If someone obtains a phase two grant, when would they consider applying for phase two B? So keep in mind that your phase two grant um, it lasts approximately two years. So what you would do, um, you know, keeping in mind that other infographic that shows the amount of time it takes for an application to get funded, I would highly suggest at least a year out starting to prepare your phase 2B application um, just because, you know, you want to make sure that you have enough time to put that together. And, you know, for example, if you don't get funded the first time, you have enough time to resubmit without leaving a significant funding gap. Um, but generally speaking, and if you're a phase one applicant, we recommend that you start on your phase two proposal right away, uh, just because it does take a while for these things to get funded and we don't want you to be left with a big funding gap. Stephanie, to that point, um, how is the applicant notified where they are in the review process? Do they get alerts or notifications? So um, when you submit your grant, you should be able to go on the website, the ERA Commons website, and you can track the different stages. So with, um, when it's in review, it will, you know, it will show up on your portal that it's currently being reviewed and you will know and get an alert when you get your summary statement back. And your summary statement is going to contain your priority score as well as the, um, you know, the critiques from each of the lead reviewers. So that, you know, once you get that back, it should give you an idea of whether or not your application is likely to get funded. If you're not sure, ask your program officer and they should be able to tell you. Um, but if you have a high enough um, priority score, then your application will be considered for funding. And then there's what's known as the just in time step where you have to submit different, you know, documentation, you know, in preparation for your award to possibly be funded. But once you get back, you should actually get an alert and it will tell you if it's, you know, if it's been reviewed and then also when you actually get those critiques back. Thank you. Do you need to be awarded a phase one before applying for a phase two? You do not. That is the whole point of the direct to phase two award. Um, it is available for people who have not gotten a phase one award, but they have performed very similar work to what would normally be performed in a phase one portion. So for that, you just have to demonstrate that you've performed, you know, what's equivalent to a phase one study. 
I should mention that if you are considering a direct to phase two proposal to please reach out to program staff because sometimes you think that you have enough work for a direct to phase two and you don't. Um, and the program staff will be honest about that because they want you to be successful. So if you are kind of wondering whether or not that's the best path for you, reach out to the program staff and they should be able to tell you. Thank you. Can phase one uh, SCTR awardee transition to be a phase two SBIR awardee? So um, if you're not a fast track applicant and you're a phase one awardee, you have to reapply again for your phase two proposal. Um, the rate of success is a lot higher for phase two proposals than phase ones. Um, usually it's a lot harder to get a new project off the ground than to get you know, a renewal for an established project. Um, if you do have a fast track award, you will transition to the phase two portion once you reach those milestones. And can they transition between SCTR and SBIR? Oh, for that, yes. Um, so it's, it is possible to do that as well. So for example, um, it is possible for companies to go from an STTR to an SBIR. Usually the issue is like with the subcontracting restrictions. Um, since you can only subcontract out about 33% of your phase one, it's kind of harder to do that. So a lot of times we will have applicants start with, a, with an STTR and then have their phase two be an SBIR. But it is possible to do that. Thank you. A uh, question about someone who has received a SBIR grant from NII, NIAID, and they mm -hmm. want to know whether they can apply for a phase 2B or a CRP from NIA. Um, so let me see. Um, generally speaking, you know, if usually, um, is, if it falls under the mission of NIA, then yes. Um, normally, we recommend going through the institute that funds the phase one and phase two proposals, but we also understand that that's not, you know, that not all institutes participate in the phase two B program. So it is possible. You just need to make sure that it is, you know, focused on aging um, and that it does fulfill the mission of the NIA as well. Thank you. And I would definitely encourage you to reach out to the program officers. And we sent out an email for MD as well. Um, they really do help and spend time with you to figure out and make sure that this is a right fit and the approach you're taking is on the path to something that is a possibility. So please do reach out to us ahead of time. Can the aims be reviewed first before completing the entire application? We would recommend that your aims get reviewed before completing the entire application. Um, that usually the, the aims page is where you start and then judging you know, by what feedback you receive from the program officer, that can usually help you write your proposal accordingly. Thank you. If we reach out to the NIH for assistance, does the communication become public information or is there any confidentiality? There is confidentiality. So um, if you are just talking to a program officer about your proposal, that you know, what you discuss with them must remain with them and it must remain internal to the NIH. Is there a specific channel to express concern or find solutions about perceived review bias? So if you have concerns about that, um, that's mostly handled by the Center for Scientific Review. Um, if you are thinking about going through a process of appealing a review that you received, I would suggest talking with your program officer about it and they should be able to walk you through that process. Is there for a support for small businesses to get help with proposal writing? So um, the applicant assistance program sort of covers that. Um, you know, we, there have been businesses that we funded that have employed grant writers and we're not allowed to recommend any particular service, but you know, if you want to hire a grant writer and you think that would be helpful, we encourage you to look into that. Thank you. Uh, a, qu a couple of questions about research interest. Uh, someone is a robotics developer and they want to know if there are any topics that tie into socially assistive robots. So we actually used to have um, a specific funding opportunity announcement 
focused on the development of socially assistive robots for persons with dementia and their caregivers. But even though we don't have that specific FOA anymore, uh, socially assistive robots are still a priority area specifically for our division of behavioral and social research. Um, so any sort of robotics or tools that can help engage persons with dementia is um, a big kind of scientific priority area for NIA. So that um, we would highly encourage you to reach out to us so we can connect you with one of the POs in that division. Thank you. A uh, company wants to know about whether they can be a PI. They're owner and chairman of their small business and they want to know if they qualify. Also, we have some questions about whether people have to have PhDs to be a PI. You do not have to have a PhD to be a PI. Um, you do want to make sure that you have the expertise on your, pan on your uh, team that you need. So for example, if you're developing something um, and you know you need a particular area of expertise that you do not have, we highly recommend bringing someone on as one of your key personnel who has that area of expertise, just so it doesn't get pointed out in scientific review. Um, so to answer the first question, if you are a, if you're submitting a small business, an SBIR proposal, you have to be primarily employed with the small business. Um, so that's kind of important. If you're not primarily employed by the small business now, you just have to guarantee that you will be at the time of the award. So just keep that in mind. Thank you. And uh, regarding PI, so there is someone who um, has a small business and they are not a U.S. citizen, but the company is a U.S. company. Can you please let them know whether uh, they can apply? And they also just wanted to clarify that they have a U.S. business partner as well. So um, specifically, if the business is located in the U.S., you should be fine. Um, I believe, I have to check on this. Um, I believe in terms of if you want to be the PI, you have to be at least a green card holder. But for the most part, if your business is located in the U.S. and you have a business partner who is a U.S. citizen, there should be some work around. Thank you. Are the technical assistance budget amounts over and above the SBIR proposal budget limits? Those are above. So those are in addition to the three hundred and five hundred thousand dollars caps. And what percent of the SBIR grants are funded? Um, so about 12.5% of new applications and about 26% of resubmitted applications are funded. Thank you. We'll just take one more question and if you have a question that you would like us to respond to, we will shoot out our email so that you have that in your inbox. Um, please do feel free to reach out to us and, and do complete the feedback form. Um, last question, is the indirect cost from a university added to the rest of the budget and does it have to be within the budget limit? Yeah, so the way indirect costs work is, um, so normally there's a negotiated rate for, uh, for indirect costs. Usually it's around 35 to 40%. But if you are, like if the university is going to be um, the recipient of a sub award, then yes, you do have to include um, the overhead costs in that indirect costs um, calculation. Thank you, Stephanie, and I appreciate everyone joining us today. Again, we hope this is the beginning of an engagement with us, and we invite you to reach out to us to schedule a meeting. Uh, we'd be happy to set up a call with you or email um, to provide you the help you need. Again, that application assistance program deadline is tomorrow, and we have some great opportunities coming up um, in January for the omnibus, as well as other targeted solicitations before then. Uh, please feel free to engage with us. And I just wanted to extend the floor to you, Dr. Davis, to see if you have any closing remarks, the same as well for our partners. Um, just that we want to thank you so much for attending today. And we encourage you to take advantage of these opportunities offered by our office. And finally, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you. And thank you as well to our collaborators. Uh, we appreciate uh, your presence, Dr. David Wolk, as well as Dr. 
Oscar Lopez. Thank you for your time and thank you to everyone for, for participating today. Thanks for letting us participate. It was a great session.